Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Dead Rabbit Radio Classics, where we listen to an older episode with some new info, a new little back end part. I used to do them in the front, but then I, it took forever to get to the episode, I couldn't reference anything, so I saved until the end. This was an episode super early in the run of Dead Rabbit Radio, episode 122. When I first started doing the episodes, I set them up with a three-digit code, right? 001, 002. I go, oh, man, you know that. And I thought that seemed a little audacious, right? I was like, what? You're going to put out that many episodes? <laughs> We're getting ready to break the code. We're getting ready. We're what? 80 episodes away from 1,000 episodes. But episode 122 is way back in the Dead Rabbit catalog. And it's an important episode for Dead Rabbit Radio. It really is. It's one of my favorite episodes for a couple of reasons that'll come apparent um, in the, when I talk about it at the end. But yeah, this again, I want to profile it because this episode going forward was a make or break moment for Dead Rabbit Radio. So everyone sit back and enjoy episode 122 of Dead Rabbit Radio, Thomas Dick and the 22 trillion alien theory. A crusty criminal, a cat that defies all odds. And then we take a look at the life of a man who tried to blend Christianity and science with hilarious results today on Dead Rabbit Radio. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Dead Rabbit Radio. I'm your host, Jason Carpenter. I'm having a great day. I hope you're having a great day too. We got a look. Blah, blah, blah. We got a lot of good stuff today. I did want to make a quick note. I've tried recording this part on a couple different podcasts. I always have to edit it out for time. Let's see if we survive now. First episode of the podcast, I watched the trailer for Hereditary for whatever reason. I thought it was a good idea at the time while I was recording the podcast. And I, I my complaint was that everyone said it was the scariest movie since The Exorcist. And I've been fooled before with, like, the Babadook, and It Follows, and all this new wave of artistic horror movies. Like, this millennial artistic horror movie genre, whatever you want to call it. And I go, well, the trailer looks good, I'll give it a shot. I gave it a shot, and my initial instincts were right. The movie was not scary at all. The movie is basically about, I mean, this is really dumbing it down, but it's about a demon... With a nut allergy. What? A demon possesses a girl. Either the demon has the nut allergy or the demon possesses a girl with a nut allergy. The girl eats nuts. Then she can't breathe so she sticks her head out a car window. And the driver goes too close to a power line and knocks her head off. And then the next 40 minutes is people crying over this poor girl who got her head knocked off. And then at the end, a bunch of old naked people show up. And the demon's trying to get into the girl's brother. And the old naked people are standing in like all the corners of their house. Full frontal, by the way. If you ever want to see what a 70-year-old naked man looks like, watch Hereditary. Teenager jumps out the window, which was the most believable part. Because that's how most people would get away from a bunch of old naked people. And then the demon possesses him. And he goes into a treehouse and they give him a crown. The end. Two hours long, by the way. Two hour long movie. Beautifully shot. But very schlocky plot with a lot of like drama put into it to make it feel feel like a heavy movie. So here's my recommendation. If you're looking for a movie that if you're looking for a movie that has a schlocky basic plot but want something more, there's an independent film that came out a couple years ago called Resolution. Two brothers go into the woods. One has a heroin addiction, the other one is there to help him kick the heroin addiction. They're in a cabin in the woods, and there's something out there. Very schlocky basic plot, but the way that it's handled, it's 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 a really good, tense, fun horror movie. And it makes you think afterwards. It real it's one of those movies that you're like, hmm, and you you kind of think about it for a couple of days. So resolution, if you're in the mood for something that I think is is far superior to hereditary. Okay, so now that that book's been sealed on that movie, let's go ahead and get started with the episode. So we have a couple stories today. Um, two of them are from New News. Now, I know people are probably like, yes, you sold that from PewDiePie. And I have to say, I don't know who PewDiePie is, so I do, actually. I watch this channel all the time. But anyways, it works. It works. So, oh, yes. First off, we're going to talk about... Now, you know, I've had this issue before where let's... Hypothetically, 
hypothetically speaking, let's say that I'm a criminal. Now, if I was a criminal in the 1970s, I would be like, oh, I just gotta wear these gloves. Can't leave fingerprints, that's how they're gonna catch me. And if you were a criminal in the 1700s, you'd be like, uh, better not stand here at this crime scene so they don't catch me. So it's like crime detection has changed over the over the centuries, basically. First, they did blood typing. They'd find the blood and they'd be like, hmm, this guy has A negative blood. Round up everyone who has A negative blood. And then it became fingerprints. Well, maybe the fingerprints came first, actually. But, I mean, they had these progression of techniques. And it's this arms race where the criminals commit crimes and they don't ever really know. When you commit the crime, you're doing it on the basis of the evidence-gathering techniques they have then. You don't know what's coming down the pipe. You're a serial killer back in the 80s. You're not really thinking about DNA. In 1983, there was an armed robbery. Okay, and actually, here, let me back up again. I know that was an exciting beginning. I think this story takes place in Britain, because these articles, again, are from 2004. The reason why I think it takes place in Britain, because they refer to an armored car as a caravan company whatever that is i i'm assuming it's an armored car and the reason why i'm i'm assuming that is because it had thirty eight thousand pounds in it so that's like i don't know thirty thousand bucks but anyways back to our action scene shooting out with this caravan i just think of like lawrence of arabia but give me the gold give me the gold Put it all in there. <laughs> Apparently leprechaun. They're stealing from leprechauns. But So these criminals, they rob this caravan in 1983. And they get away with 38,000 pounds. And the dude's running away. And at one point, he takes off. He had a, a stocking, which, you know, like a pantyhose over his face to disguise his face. Again, it's 1983. They weren't really thinking that much. Put pantyhose over his face to disguise it. And at one point, he pulls the pantyhose off of his face he probably left the ones on his legs still but he pulled the pantyhose off of his face and kept running now we're in the year 2004 which is where my new news folder comes from and the detectives i i can imagine he i can imagine a single detective has been staring at this piece of pantyhose for the past 20 years but he's looking at it and he goes dude this thing's full of dandruff let's see if we can get some dna and they did the guy had i guess bad dandruff enough dandruff that's noticeable and they pulled some of the dandruff off, which is, you know, skin flakes. So it would have DNA in it. They tested it. 20 years later, he got arrested for this crime, for this bank robbery. And you know that at that point, he's probably like, I've already spent the money. And he was doing whatever else. And he's sitting there. And he's like, man, I really should have bought some head and shoulders. That thing popped in his head for a second. I really should have bought some dandruff shampoo, but I didn't. Why am I having that thought right now? All of a sudden, psh, army guys, or probably more likely police, psh, break into his house, and arrest him. Convicted because he had dandruff. So, and, I mean, so he never could have predicted that. He never could have predicted that. If he did, he probably should have worn two pantyhoses, one to keep all of his dandruff in, and the other one to disguise his face. Or, simply, don't take your mask off until you get home. That's another pro tip. Interestingly enough, this happened in 2004, he got sentenced to 15 years in prison, so you know what that means. He gets free next year. That's a great thing about doing news <laughs> from decades ago, because it seems oddly relevant sometimes. Okay, next, new news. Very short one. I just thought this one was adorable. 2004, if you could have guessed. There was this family in Russia. And they're like, you know what we should do? Let's go on a vacation. The family's like, yay, where are we going? And they're like, Siberia? So for whatever reason, they go to Siberia to visit. What is what is there? It's huts and caribou and a giant impact crater from an airburst meteorite and gulags. Siberia. If you lived here, you'd already be home. Like, who who wants to go there? Anyways, they vacation to Siberia. They go sit. At the side of a frozen lake. It's a wasteland. But anyway, so they're in Siberia. Maybe they like skiing. I guess it's probably good for skiing. I imagine it's flat, though. I always imagined Siberia was just a continent-wide plain. Are there mountains over there? I don't know. Anyways, this family from Russia decides to go further east. And they go to Siberia, and they bring their little cat. They bring Kuzya. Hey, Kuzya. Meow. Let's go on this vacation to this horrid wasteland that we used to send political prisoners to. Meow. So they're there, and it sucked. The play, the people were fine with it. They stayed there for about three weeks. But 
the Kazuya was like, I'm out, dude. This place totally blows. It's like super cold and it's dry. And I'm pretty sure there's a house made out of toothpaste over there. I don't like this. I don't like this at all. But they just heard him go, Meow, and he like jumped off their lap and he ran away. So they looked for him for the three weeks. They're like, Kazuya, Kazuya. And he didn't come. And they're like, all sad. They're like, well, that sucks. I mean, again, lesson learned. Don't go to Siberia for your vacation. But eventually their time ended and they had to go home. They were like, well, our vacation's over. We have to go back home to the West Russia. So they leave and they leave little Kazuya there. Three months later, after they leave, they hear it. Meow, meow, at their door. And they're like, what? What? Did you buy a new cat? No, I'm still getting over Kazuya disappearing in the wilderness. Meow. They open the door. It's Kazuya. Kazuya walked 1,300 miles across Siberia to get back home. That's how much he hated Siberia. He could have just been like, eh, I'm just going to lay here or I'll build a new home here or meet like a nice cute cat woman. No, he's like, screw this, I'm going home. Walks through Siberia. When they get him, they notice that he had lost weight. His claws were basically turned to little nubs, like they had been completely filed down. He had meat, animal meat, in his teeth. Supposedly animal meat. I don't think they took it to the DNA lab, but the article said, you know, he had like flesh in his teeth. And he had a couple bite marks on him. But other than that, he was totally fine. Little Kuzja. Imagine hating someplace that much... That you would walk 1,300 miles to get out of it. I, I don't even think I would do that. I'd probably walk 10 and be like, you know what? Maybe I can start a new life here. I'd probably walk 2 and do that. Sad ending to the story, though. The story is from 2004, so little Kuzya most likely has passed away by now. But if you're in heaven, Kuzya, I hope it's warm and sunny and is opposite of Siberia as you can get. Meow. That was an EVP. Kuzya is con- contacting us from beyond the grave. Okay. The next story I want to talk about, I was going to talk about yesterday, but I ran out of time. And I think it's an interesting story because it it kind of hinges on that conflict between religion and science. Now, the conflict's been going on since the first nerd picked up a textbook. We're going to look at the life and times of a man named Thomas Dick. Now, I will say this. I found out about this guy because I was prepping another story. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. A Christian philosopher slash scientist. And I was like, oh, I'm going to look into this guy. I'm kind of scrolling through my phone, looking at it at work. And then I just started laughing. First off, let's address his last name. Now, I am not so immature that when I see a guy with the last name of Dick, I immediately think of penises. I saw his name. I'm like, Thomas Dick. It didn't even occur to me. I'm like, oh, you know, I start reading the article. And it's like, there's on Wikipedia, it was like, you know, Thomas Dick was born in this is the year. And he was doing this. And then it said he worked at his father's linen shop. His father made like wove clothes or something like that. I guess I should preface this. This starts off in the 1700s. This is mostly late 1700s, early 1800s. It's like the father he had this, had this, um, had this, um, linen shop where he made clothes. His father's name, this great Christian philosopher would go on to be this author, this influential author. His father's name is Mungo Dick. Mungo Dick. And I laughed out loud when I saw that. Now, that's when I was like, okay, let's break down Mungo Dick here for a second. One, it makes it sound like he has a huge dick. If if you go, dude, that's a Mungo Dick, you, you don't think, oh, that must be a Scottish name. You're like, no, that means the dude has a big dick. Now, to be fair... When these guys were around in the late 17, early 1800s, dick what didn't mean penis yet, but it does now. So when I'm reading an article and there's a guy named Mungo Dick in it, I'm going to laugh out loud. Secondly, and again, I know that Mungo is, oh, and by the way, Mungo means uh, beloved in Scot Scottish. So basically his name is Beloved Dick, but... I get that Mungo is a Scottish name, and it's like probably a little racist for me to make fun of it, but when I think of Mungo, I think of a eight-foot-tall, brute, Gollum-esque, not Gollum from Lord of the Rings, but like big stone dude, Solomon Grundy dude. That's who you think of. You think of a henchman. You think of a lunk guy named Mungo. 
Imagine growing up in a house with a guy named Mungo. Again, if you guys are like, Jason, this is... So I'm trying to read this article now after having this vision of this lurching henchman just standing behind this young boy and I just couldn't focus anymore. So Thomas Dick was... I just imagine this giant, like, Mungo. <laughs> Mungo no like science. Mungo like God. And then Thomas Dick's like, but dad, you have to understand, God made science. And Mungo's like, whoa, head hurt. And I imagine that was pretty much his childhood life. And you go, well, that might be an exaggeration, but it's not really because he wanted to be a scientist because he saw a meteor one day. And so he's reading all the books he could, even when he was in the linen shop. Mungo's like crashing through the shop, throwing books around. Make yarn! Make yarn! (laughs) And so, anyway, so Thomas Dick, because he had no support from his parents early on, he actually made his own telescope. By He got like some eyeglasses and ground down the lenses. I think that story's probably a bit apocryphal. I, I don't think that story actually happened. But it would be awesome if it did, just to give something for Mungo to destroy. He's like, no, I think. She's like, Dad, no, I worked on that. Uh, only see with real God eyes. Anyways, by the time he was 16, his parents kind of started to warm up to the egg. Because I guess I should have said this before Mungo destroyed the shop. They were Christian. They were like, not like super crazy Westboro Baptist Church Christian, but they were devout. So when their son was like, Oh, look at shiny stars. Maybe that's like a rock from another galaxy. Mungo's like smashing through the wall. So anyways, but by the time they're 16, they're like, uh, I mean, uh, science may be okay. And then Thomas is like, yay. Anyways, so he starts to like really get into the science stuff. Now what's okay. He becomes a teacher. He becomes a writer. And he starts writing he starts writing articles for a magazine. And I thought this was another just bizarre how okay, you have a magazine. He start okay, so he starts I'm reading this article and I'm thinking who wrote this? Mad Libs on a board afternoon. We got Mungo Dick running around and he writes for a magazine called Monthly Magazine. That is the most I mean, I, I I thought about it afterwards, and I thought, yes, there are newspapers called, like, the Daily Star or the Daily Tribune, but I don't know if I've ever seen a newspaper called Daily Paper. That's just it. But anyways, he wrote for a magazine that came out every month called Monthly Magazine. It should have been, actually, now that I think about it, it should have been Mungo's Monthly Magazine. That would have been much better. It was... It's, that would be a better plot. Mungo actually has a monthly magazine, not a linen shop, I'm glad I'm rewriting this guy's life history. And it is a magazine dedicated to uh, religious topics and sports. And Mungo's like, me put religion in for soul, but sports is what makes me feel alive. And it's all like rugby stuff because they're in Europe. And the son's trying to like sneak in science articles. And so as Mungo's like proofreading, he has his little glasses on on his giant monster head. As he's trying to proofread the magazine, he notices like in the sports article. Because the sports articles would say stuff like ball smash through goal, team win. And then he starts to notice like equations sneaking in there like the ball arced 90 degrees. Oh, and then Mungo's just like smashing the printing press. Son, what you do? Where these numbers come from? Okay, let's get back to the real story here. So Thomas Dick ends up writing these books and he writes a bunch of books about Christian philosophy. One of them, his, his big book was The Christian Philosopher or The Connection of Science and Philosophy with Religion. And that, he, that was a huge book and he, it was about him trying to merge the two ideas together. And from then on out, he was known as the Christian philosopher. And he was highly regarded as like a well-thought-out guy who actually did a good blend of science and religion. But where he started to go wrong, because that's all just thought experiments where I could say, here's science, here's religion, and these are the ways we can look at them. What started to go wrong, other than Mungo, then smashing through the city of London, that was actually a big incident. They had to take Mungo down because he was attacking a bunch of bobbies. So, but the the big problem he made was that he started to basically formulate scientific theories himself. And he was a smart guy. And people have looked back and said, it's interesting because he used data. He actually, like, he thought like a scientist. 
but his conclusions were wildly off. And he came to this this calculation that there's 250 people per square mile in Britain. And there's millions and millions of square miles in the solar system. God would not create an empty universe. Therefore, to extrapolate all that information in our solar system alone, 22 trillion living creatures, from little ant monsters to full humanoids. In our solar system alone, 22 trillion people. On the moon, he believed there were 4 billion people. Now, of course, this was this caught the attention of millions of people, very controversial in the scientific community, but it, it excited the imagination of the public who read the book. They're like, whoa, we're surrounded by, we're in a living universe. In 1837, Thomas Dick came up with the idea to draw a giant triangle in the middle of Siberia. So that way other aliens would go, hey, look, there's life down there. And it's funny because that's a stupid idea now. But back then they didn't have cities illuminated with lights. Like really the only way that you could look at a planet in passing to see if there was life on it back then would to have a continent-sized drawing on it. And he's like, listen, I know that's going to take a lot of work, but my dad and a plow, that triangle is done in a day. He can easily walk across Siberia in a day. Hey, I didn't realize that. Siberia and Kuzia. Anyway, so the cat, the cat meow. Mongo-like cat. He's like petting the cat. And they're like, no, Mongo, no, no, you're petting it too hard. Oh, Mongo, so sad. (laughs) So anyways, what happened was, of course... As scientific advancements get better, his theories start to fall further and further out of favor. And a story that we're going to be covering tomorrow, let's consider this a little bit of part one, he plays a minor role in that story, and that's why I'm talking about it now. He plays a minor role in that story, but that story also helped lead to his downfall in a way, because it was a hoax that he got caught up in unknowingly. He didn't know he was getting caught up in it, but, and then, you know, so he was this great writer and philosopher and stuff like that. But in the end, he died pretty much penniless. He didn't make a lot of good deals with his publishers and he died. His books, other people, uh, David Livingston, the dude who was like in the jungles and they're like Livingston, I presume he got lost in the jungle or something. I don't know why you're famous for getting lost in the jungle, but anyways, he went out there and did a bunch of like nature work and, other jungle stuff and he compared he's famous he's famous but so he's just not nobody but i guess he's famous just for being lost anyways he i guess his review doesn't matter now that i just realized he's just a just a a guy who doesn't know directions he said that the books that thomas dick wrote were on the level of the bible like that's how that's the level of esteem he had in his lifetime people Looked to him for a way to bridge those two things. And he ended up dying pretty much penniless. Mungo actually had to dig his grave with his bare hands, crying the whole time, going, Why God take son? No God, only science. And then like lightning. So that, that didn't happen, obviously. That didn't happen, obviously. It is interesting, though, to note that, again, the word dick did not mean penis when they when he was young but by the time Thomas Dick died the word dick definitely was slang for penis so i'm sure he had to hear a lot of jokes before his last 5 years of life about having a dad named Mungo Dick but that's the life and times of Thomas Dick i wanted to talk about that i think the story is interesting and i think it's interesting how they've still never really been able to combine those two paths so maybe they're not compatible science and religion But again, I think science doesn't care whether or not they're compatible, and religion does want them to be compatible, does kind of glom onto it, and that's really what that story exemplifies. Thomas Dick was really trying to say, hey, listen, give me some of that science, give me some of that knowledge, I'm with you. And Yeah, we've never been able to really find that gap. You hear a lot of paranormal investigators saying, hey, let's get a scientist over here. Let's use this equipment to see if we can scientifically prove ghosts exist. You never hear a scientist goes, you know what we really need to figure out how the Higgs boson works? We need a bunch of psychics. Let's get some remote viewers over to CERN and find out what's going on. Weird divide. It's a weird little break. 
deadrabbitradio at gmail.com is going to be your email address. You can also hit us up at facebook.com slash deadrabbitradio. Twitter is at Jason O. Carpenter. Dead Rabbit Radio is the daily paranormal conspiracy and true crime podcast. You don't have to listen to it every day, but I'm glad you listened to it today. Have a great one, guys. So that was episode 122, Thomas Dick and the 22 Trillion Alien Theory. It's so funny because on yesterday's episode, I was ranting about how I used to fit three stories into an episode. And I did it all the time, and I think that I really crammed a lot of good content. And the reason why I did that, I don't do it anymore, because I realized how much that last episode, The House That Eats the Dead, drove me nuts. I go, these are three really good stories, and I'm just blurring past them. I'm trying to get three stories done in a short time limit. And it's because I don't think the stories, I don't think two of the stories are good enough to stand on their own. What's interesting is this episode here is the reason why a lot of times I do three stories. I like all three of these stories. And I think the episode's pretty well paced, right? We have the story starts off. Bandit got caught with dandruff, right? I mean, it's kind of a cool science true crime story. Nowadays, I probably could have told that in a minute and put it on my YouTube TikTok channel, my YouTube shorts and all that stuff. But I think it's totally fine. I think it's a fun story. It's detailed, beginning, middle, end. And now we don't... I tried looking for him after the episode. I didn't actually go out and look for him, but... I tried to see if there was any mention of him afterwards because the story ended like he got out of jail quite a while ago. No, no, no follow up for that. And then the story about a little cat walking through Siberia. That was considered there's all here's the you know, what's interesting about Dead Rabbit Radio is it it grew too quickly. It grew too quickly. There's too many episodes now. To wrangle it in. There's a big debate on the Patreon Discord. And this debate even predated the Patreon Discord. The show needs a wiki. The show needs a wiki. I got a request from someone. I think it was uh, Nikolai a while back. Nikolai Michigan. I think he was asking on the Patreon Discord. What's the episode with the cat that walked across Siberia? I was like, I don't know. Like Sometimes I can actually put in enough keywords or put in enough headlines that I'll type in like Russian cat and the episode will pop up. A lot of times people will send me emails go, hey, what's that story about the the mud crawler in Utah? And I type in mud crawler. I remember that episode. I really like that episode. But I couldn't find this episode. It basically become lost media within the show itself. And people are saying, because I will go on the Patreon Discord. <laughs> I'll ask this question at least once a month. Have I covered this yet? And I'll throw in some weird story, and then the people who happen to be on that day, because usually I'm prepping a story, right? I'm I'm getting ready to record it for that week, sometimes even that day. They'll say, no, I don't think so, but, I mean, we should, we should really have a wiki at this point. The thing is, is there's, what, 920-some-odd episodes, right? 928 episodes at this point, with two to three stories per episode. So we're talking about... What? (laughs) I'm not the best at math, but a minimum of 1,800 plus stories, right? That we'd have to catalog in this wiki. It would just take a ton of time. And then you have to have all the troll control, right? Because people go in and just write like fart, fart, fart. And then you got to go in and refix the page, stuff like that. So, which is easy, but I mean, it's just, I always look at what I talked about when I did the, when I did the behind the scenes Discord episode what I need to do the show, and then everything else. And what I need to do the show is my research, my recording, and my editing process. Anything other than that, if it weighs too much, I cut it loose. If I'm looking at a wiki to set up to find episodes, it's a huge amount of time. And then when people troll it, now I got to go and take care of that stuff as well. And I know a lot of people are volunteering to set this stuff up, but that's also a huge amount of work for them to do. Right? So anything that is not part of that core process gets cut loose. Sometimes that includes the TikToks and the shorts. Sometimes I don't do one for that day because I'm like, I'm just doing too much for the show. So the podcast is the main thing. But back to back to this episode, that was a little, again, behind, I love behind the scenes stuff. So I hope you guys like this stuff too. But, um, the little cat, Kushka. Right? Running around, Siberia, great story. Do you need to spend 15 minutes telling it? No, you can tell that story in five to eight minutes, and it's a good story, beginning, middle, and end. And then we got the Thomas Dick story. And this story, 
I wanted to kind of break this down for you because this was a very, very big possible cliff that the show could have driven off of. This this behind the scenes might last a little longer than some of the other ones. But and before I go forward, I want to give a shout out. I'm going to put this in the show notes as well. Way back in the day. You guys are fantastic. You guys are fantastic. Case in point, way back in the day, Swain on Discord. This was like the original Discord. The original Discord put together a animation, a PowerPoint animation proof of concept, and they used this episode. It's only like a minute long. I actually should see if he'll let me do use it as a YouTube short, but it's actually just a minute long. It's really cool, and it's telling, it's animation of the story. Again, here's the thing. Like, I super fantastic, right? And I think the idea was, what if we started animating episodes Every so often, but we're putting out so much content. That's the problem. When you put out five episodes a week, if I had started a wiki project when I first started the show, it would be manageable. But at this point, it's not. Every so often, I have to go back and change show notes, like mass change show notes. And that's a weeks, if not month or two long project. I, I have started that and then I'll just have to give up halfway through. Anyways. Great animation. I'll put it in the show notes. It's really, really cute. It shows what is possible with the show, right? Like, that would be really cool to have some animated segments. But let's talk about the the story of Thomas Dick. The story of Thomas Dick in and of itself, super fascinating. A scientist and a religious figure trying to blend the two. And you see that a lot, right? I think it's awesome. I think there is a combination between science and religion. I don't think one cancels out the other. I think they kind of embolden each other, right? And it causes conflict too, which is good because you need conflict to grow. I learned that. (laughs) I learned that watching Zombies 3. I never knew that before the year 2022. The story itself is great, right? Christian slash scientist who's trying to combine the best of both worlds. I don't believe that science and religion are mutually exclusive. I think they can actually be great friends. And it creates good conflict. I think to further your faith or to further your research, you need someone arguing with you and telling you no. So I think the character itself, not a character, he's a real person, but the person himself is super fascinating, right? I love that story. And then it led into the next story about this moon hoax, which I'll put a link in the show notes. I recommend checking that one out. I haven't listened to it in a while. I don't know if I have a ton of stuff to say about it. But this episode was super important for dead rabbit radio because when you are doing stuff well let me let me back up here for a second so one of the things that i do originally i had no notes originally i would just read an article and then turn on the mic and i would talk about what i had just read and it was really stressful for me because i have to keep looking over at the article or rereading it losing my place then i started writing notes and the show, I can't say the show never intended to be a comedy. I think originally it was in the comedy genre. It still technically is. Actually, no, now, now it's listed as a science show. But, you know, I was obviously influenced by comedic podcasts like Sofa King Podcast and The Parapod. Like, these were podcasts that I held in really high esteem, and they were super funny. And I, and I was like, I'll talk about this stuff. I'm not going to be super serious and dour about it. But I can't say I necessarily went into it thinking, oh, this is going to be a laugh a minute. If you listen to the first episode, when I'm talking about like how animals talk to each other, I went to work. Like I re- recorded those first three episodes, right? And I released them. And a couple of people at work listened to them. And one of the dudes is an old friend of mine, Zach. He goes, you sound like an idiot. And he goes, the thing is, is like, it sounds like you. Because you say stuff like that at work. It wasn't a performance. I've had conversations with you and you say stuff that dumb. That's not how it works. That's not how animals talk to each other. When they squeak, they're not giving each other locations to their nut stash. So I realized, like, even if I wasn't trying to be openly comedic, just for me telling the stories, there's going to be some funny stuff, right? Just the, I know the way that I tell stuff. Can be funny. I know the way that I mispronounce stuff. That's unintentionally funny. I don't mean to do that. I never tried to be too serious. There there, early on in the show, you'll hear some tonal shifts. Sometimes the episodes are a little too serious. Sometimes they're a little too funny, a little too zany. I mean, you can hear me kind of going back and forth. Now, you may have the first story in an episode be funny and the second episode be kind of darker, like a true crime thing. But before, it would be sh- like 
I was like, I was trying to figure out like what type of pot, cause I was getting feedback and I was like, well, what do people actually want? Do they want this? Do they want that? And I finally realized what show do I want, right? I want a show with a little bit of comedy when it's appropriate and a little bit of seriousness when it's appropriate. And sometimes the blending of the two is fun, right? So I write my notes now. I take notes and I'll write down story beats, Write down the story beats of what's happening in the story. This happens. I'm trying to work on the and then this. I'm trying to work on that. I've fallen into that crutch recently where I was like, and then the alien beamed them up to the house. Now they're on the roof of the house. I'm, I'm trying to work, trying to fix that. But that's a fairly recent thing. I don't know why I've fallen into that trap. But one thing I don't do is write down jokes. Now, I have in the past when I'm researching notes, I'm laughing so hard. I come up with a funny joke. I was like, oh, dude, this skit's going to be so funny. Not necessarily skit, but I like reading the notes. I'm laughing. I'm like, oh, dude, this is going to be so funny. And I would write it in my notes. I'd actually put in parentheses like, <laughs> not, it wouldn't be like tell joke here. It'd be like, joke about this. Make a joke. Like, or I would put out the joke. And whenever I recorded it, it was, aw- it was, the, it was the worst joke. Like, I, when I thought of it, it was hilarious. And I bet you anything, if when I was recording it, it popped in my head, it, I would have thought it was funny enough to stay in the episode. I edit out bad jokes, breathing, and uhs. Those are my biggest edit edits, right? And then the ending gets really chopped up. That The ending part, sometimes I can kind of drone on and on. Okay, Jason, we get it. Let's chop it down in two minutes, right? We, we went and said, uh, let's chop it down in two minutes. So... When I write a joke down, it's really bad. What happened with this was I was sitting at work and I was reading about Thomas Dick. And when I saw the guy's name was Mungo Dick, I laughed out loud. And I started thinking of all these zany scenarios that Mungo Dick could be in. And this is one of those episodes that I can I can hear myself kind of sweating in the episode. I can hear the I can hear the water moisture hit the mic because This is one of those episodes where some of the jokes I actually knew ahead of time going in. And I will say something, quote unquote, unfunny or unfunny. I mean, your mileage may vary, right? And I can, because I have no audience reaction, right? I say it and then I can hear myself second guessing that. Was that funny or not? The joke that I laugh, that I still think is the funniest joke, because again, it was just right off the top of my head when I was sitting there, when I was listening to the episode again to do this bonus thing was when uh, Mungo has the newspaper. Mungo has the paper. Like, the paper where it said, the paper was like the daily paper or something, and I said, what? That's like calling such and such. That joke I had written down. <laughs> You're like, yeah, Jason, that joke was super dumb. I was like, what? They call it the daily paper. That's like calling something this. And like I had written that in my notes. I remember it. And it just falls with a thud. But the joke that I came up with on the spot that I actually laughed, and I almost started laughing too hard. I kind of tried to hold it back. You can hear it in my voice. When I said... Mungo makes this newspaper for, oh, it was like religion and sports. Like that was a total, like I just came up on the top of my head. Religion is good for the soul, but sports makes me feel alive. Like that was, and I was like, to, see, that was the impromptu joke. I didn't have any, none of that stuff written down. I don't know why. I think in the notes, it might've said that newspaper is about two things. And I think I probably only wrote down one of them. Whatever the reason was, I thought that joke was really funny. But as far as that goes, right, I, I don't I I want the I want the show to be entertaining. And I know at this point, a lot of that comes from comedy. But again, imagine getting up on stage and being like, I'm going to tell I'm going to tell jokes. They're going to pop in my head or they won't like you can't force them. It's just such a weird. This podcast is weird in that sense. I think most comedy podcasts have other people on. And some episodes aren't funny. at all. <laughs> Trust me, don't get me wrong. Some episodes aren't funny. They're not supposed to be funny, right? Uh, Scooby-Doo SVU about the connection between the odd connection between people in the paranormal world and sex pests, child predators and stuff like that. That's that's not a laugh a minute. It's not a funny episode. It would be horrible if it was. So really, I thought that was an interesting look at the behind the scenes, the comedy part of it. But I also wanted to talk about Mungo because this when you are creating anything over a period of time, I think, I don't know if everyone does this. I'm probably hyper aware of it because the show's gone on for so long and it's five episodes for 10 weeks, a two week break, and then five episodes a week for 10 weeks. And that's so good. Flanderization. 
Flanderization. It's a term meaning from Ned Flanders from The Simpsons. It's where a character starts off as kind of a well-rounded character with maybe one or two quirks. And then by season 13, they're just the quirk. Ned Flanders is a good name for it, Flanderization. I think the best example is the characters from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Like early on in season two or three, three or four, somewhere around there, they made a joke about Charlie not being able to read. And then it became to him being not only completely illiterate, like once they're like, I can't read your handwriting, then it came to not only is he completely illiterate, he's he's mentally handicapped. Like he's drinking paint and he's king of the rats and all this stuff. And, and while funny, right, it becomes a broad character when before the character had a little more nuance. Dennis, for example, started off, he was a playboy. He was an egotistical playboy and then he started to be like, no matter what, I'm going to get this girl. And then he became a like rapist. They've made vague references, not so vague references to him being more forceful with the women or manipulating them, not just the dentist system, but actually like tricking them. He boards up his windows so they can't get out to maybe even being a serial killer. Right, because they started off being like they have an episode where he's a little slimier than normal, and now he's a psychopathic serial killer. And, and and Mac, right, the jokes are, oh, he's homophobic, and now he's gay. Like they took it, and I'm not saying that the jokes in between these things weren't funny, but now they're just these stereotypes: the psychopath, the flamboyant homosexual, and the illiterate fool. You lose a lot of nuance there. There's a lot of stories they probably could have told that they can't tell now because Charlie is mentally handicapped, right? You can't, it wouldn't make sense if he went and had this adventure then. So when you do something over a long enough time period, that's the risk, right? You start off with a character, they're a little unsure of themselves, in season three, four, five, they're a bumbling coward, right? Because the fans go, oh, that was that episode was so funny when... Wesley dropped the dropped the the spike or whatever he was trying to give to Buffy, and then they go, "Oh, they like this kind of thing." You see it a lot too. I know I'm going deep in this, but you see it a lot with characters, right? There's a moment between Spike and Buffy, and the fans go, "Ooh, or Spike and Buffy going to get together?" And the writers go, "Yeah, sure." It's season six. We've run out of stuff to talk about. They're dating. So you got to be careful of that type of stuff. And this episode. I, the entire Dead Rabbit Radio came close to becoming flanderized because people loved Mungo. I loved Mungo. He's a funny voice to do. He's a funny character. And I realized that I can't bring him back. I can't bring him back. I, he's popped up in other episodes as a son, as Mungo Jr. And his voice, I mean, it's not the most clever impersonation, but his voice, his mannerisms have become Bigfoot, right? When I talk about Bigfoot, he sounds a lot like Mungo Dick, the way he talks about his Mungo Dick. But I remember, like, I was getting comments being like, dude, I hope I see more of Mungo. Like, this is really awesome. This episode's so funny. And this is kind of coming, uh, I don't know how many episodes past the Hans episode, the Monkeys Don't Exist episode. So that character was super popular, too. I, there were times, Hans showed back up for an episode, and I think it ruined the episode, honestly. Um, Hans showed up in the Bam Margera Afterlife episode. See, when you have an episode that's just listing crazy things, people say, I'm, I haven't edited the Jean Benet Doesn't Exist episode yet, but I'm kind of afraid that that episode's kind of dry, because it's just me saying, she believes this, and she believes that, and she believes this, and she believes that. And so, Hans was a crutch. I had that Bam Margera Afterlife episode. It was just a super bizarre conspiracy theory. So I brought on this crazy character, Hans. And he's being wacky. And I'm like, Hans, how dumb are you? And he's like, oh, I'm pretty dumb. Yuck, yuck. And people liked it. People liked it. And I remember I usually don't navigate the show or make decisions based on one comment. I almost never do. But I did get one comment on the Bam Margera episode. This was on YouTube. This is when I used to take episodes and cut them in half. T -t Took an extremely long amount of time. That's why I don't do it anymore. People say, why don't you put those little... Because uh, it takes me too long. But um, he listens. He goes, who in the world is Franz? Like, I, what, what are you talking about? Are you talking about Bam's good friends? Uh, Franz 
helmet head or whatever like he mentioned some other guy with that name he goes this was nonsensical this made no sense and i thought yeah this is the problem i have to make the show i like to make the show for people who this is their first episode as the same time as this is someone's 928th episode and when you have reoccurring characters when you have in jokes it makes it so hard to get into and when a character is so odd, has such an odd speech pattern as Hans Wormhat or Mungo Dick. Now, here's the thing. I 100% saw two paths laid out in front of me. I saw a path where Mungo shows up every so often to do something funny. I'm like doing an episode about are there angels in space? And Mungo's like, angels in space? That was another thing. I can never do the same voice. I can never do the characters the same voice each time. But Mungo say angels in space. That's science and religion. Mungo, what are you doing in the studio? I heard you say angels and then the science word. Mungo, why don't you sit down and talk to us about what you think about religion? Oh, that <laughs> I would have ended the show. I would have been like, this is awful. This is awful. But part of me... Part of me saw that path. Because it's been done before, right? It's been done before. Shows flanderize themselves all the time. You have a popular episode, and then you just go with it. Now, I've had episodes where I've talked about Illuminati and Kevin Spacey and stuff like that, and they've been some of my highest performing content on YouTube. Before the YouTube shorts, now that's blowing all the episodes on YouTube away. YouTube's not really set up for long form, no image it's a video platform, right? And I'm talking about stuff. The podcast has always been more successful than the YouTube, right? But as far as YouTube goes, I've always thought about when I do these Illuminati episodes about Kevin Spacey, I've talked about this before, all these big episodes, they're always huge blowout episodes. Ellen DeGeneres is under house arrest. Tom Hanks is secretly working for the Illuminati. Huge numbers. And then people go, what? This sucked. <laughs> because they expected me to be taking it seriously. People for the first time were finding the show and it wasn't what they thought. Now, longtime listeners of the show loved it, right? But every time that happened, I thought, okay, so this is interesting. There's a, there's this listenership that I have that I love and a show that I love doing. And then I could just do a shill show. I could do a show believing in all these stuff that I know other people are going to believe in. I'm going to make... Tons of money, right? The show's going to blow up. There's a YouTuber I watch named Andy Signor. He used to be on Movie Junkies or Movie Fights. or It was Movie Fights, Movie Fights. Screen Junkies was the name of the channel. He was one of the very first casualties of Me Too. And he came out afterwards, after all these lawsuits, and said, listen, she made everything up, and here's the proof, and da-da-da-da-da. So if you don't like Andy Signor, I understand why you don't like Andy Signor. But he seems to have had some receipts that a lot of the allegations against him. He said, I did cheat on my wife and all that stuff. But so Andy Signor has his own show now called Popcorn Planet. And when he first started up, I was watching it a lot. He's doing movie stuff. He's doing movie stuff. And I was like, okay. But, you know, he didn't have the same views as he used to. His reputation was tarnished. He was coming back out of a hole. And then he started, like, covering stuff about Britney Spears' conservatorship. Or the Amber Heard, or the Zach, he went hard on the Zack Snyder guys during the Snyder Cut. His channel exploded. So then he just started doing Britney Spears stuff and Amber Heard stuff and and beefing with uh, Ray Fisher from the DC movies. He's Cyborg. And and as a longtime fan, that wasn't the content I was interested in, but new people. He was making more money. He had a whole new fan base and he had all these new people. So I just kind of like you know, kind of waved as the boat was sailing off east to take him out there. I mean, hey, I wish you the best of luck. That wasn't the content that I was interested in. Why did I even start talking about that? Oh, he flanderized the show, right? He did a couple episodes, and to me, it became a gossip channel, not a movie channel. The gossip involved movie stars, but I'm really not into whether and all that stuff. So I remember thinking, like, I could do the Kevin Spacey shows until the show ends, which actually turned out to be pretty quickly. I think YouTube was cracking down on those guys. You know, this was all, you know, pre, like, 2019, 2020, before they really started coming down on conspiracy content. But I remember thinking, I could do that. I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to make a show where I was lying to people. Uh, and, and along this line, wrap it up like this. I remember thinking, I remember at one point I had Mungo... Hans Wormhat, 
and Miley Cyrus. I wish I knew what episode this was. I sh- re- there's a the very first time I did this. I released a season X trailer. It was like season five or six or something like that. Where all of the Dead Rabbit Radio vehicles were destroyed. All of them. And there was this evil group that had come after me. I thought it was a kind of fun idea. I came up with it while I was in the shower. I literally walked out. I was still dripping wet. I recorded all these dumb voices. Edited it together. Had a lot of fun with it. Um, Miley Cyrus... Long time personal friend. <laughs> long time. People get so mad when I bring that up. Uh, long time personal friend, Miley Cyrus. See, that's an in-joke, right? You wouldn't know that if you hadn't listened to the episode where I talked about my personal... <laughs> I make it even more intimate each time. My personal friendship with Miley Cyrus. I'd give no other details to that. We talked for a while. Miley Cyrus... Hans Wormhat and uh, Mungo showed up. We formed a team to take down the bad guys who blew up all the vehicles. I thought it was a great way to start off whatever season that was. I kind of toyed with the idea of doing it again next season, and I was like, nope, nope, no extra work. The show's already hard enough. That was a fun thing. It was, again, it was impulsive, and you did it, and it was fun. When I sit and I plan stuff out, and I'm trying to, like, do all these jokes they don't land i'm not a comedian in that sense but i remember thinking at one point we did the trailer people really like that i think mungo's come back as his son or my son mungo jr people think that's funny but i remember at one point i was planning on doing an episode about the people versus michael jackson because i personally believe that michael jackson was innocent of those allegations and this was this was when that documentary came out like surviving neverland or finding neverland or whatever it was it was trash. It was trash journalism. It was trash, true crime, garbage, right? And I was thinking about doing a rebuttal for that. And Hans Wormhat was going to be his defense lawyer. And I was like putting up notes and I go, this is awful. No one wants to hear me do this voice for 30 minutes straight, especially about a subject that they may not even care about. Who who really cares whether or not Michael Jackson's guilty, either just fans or smear journalists, in my opinion. But... And then, so I scratched that idea, but I was planning it. I actually have a special folder of Michael Jackson research. I do. I, he's like, no, we're not going to do that. And I didn't feel confident enough in me just telling the story and whatever. And then I was going to do an episode. I don't remember what the setup was, but it was Mungo in the morning. It was a radio talk show skit that was going to be reoccurring with Mungo and Hans. And it was like, this is trash. Why are you even Why are you even trying to do this? Mungo was funny the first time you did him. He's shown up a couple times. And it's even if you don't know the Mungo joke, you just figure Jason is someone who would name his son Mungo Jr., even though you're not Mungo Sr. Even if he didn't know the Mungo setup, it's a funny joke. So I wanted to, as cars are all of a sudden starting up all around me, I have to end this, and this has been really long. I wanted to show you guys the history of... Oh, never mind, I'm going to wait till this truck goes away. I wanted to show you guys the behind the scenes. It's just a simple episode, right? But I almost like... I could have ruined the show. I could have ruined the show by bringing on these reoccurring guests, which I think would become funny or would get super old quickly, right? It's like, what? Some kids got molested. Here comes Mungo. Oh, who's the bad guy who touched that kid? Like, sometimes it would be super out of place, right? I think it would have gotten old really fast. I think new listeners would have been like, what in the world? Why is he doing these? Why is he doing these voices? Like, what does this have anything to do with the topic? And it's just, it's that wire, you know, it's that wire you have to balance when you're doing something creative. There is a balance between listening to the listeners and doing your own thing. And I think I've, we've all have a hundred examples of shows that have been ruined because of relationships that you're like, what, why are those two characters together? Kylo Ren and whoever that girl was, Skywalker daughter are together now i don't watch i don't watch any of those movies but i know people are like that was so shoehorned in but the fans quote unquote the fans wanted it right this vocal minority wanted it and people are like this is dumb we've all seen that it's really easy to mess up your own project and i'm glad so far i haven't been able to do that right i've tried <laughs> i've tried i almost had mungo in the morning it was radio dj dj thing thought it was so funny i was like la- i've recorded fake ads I remember once I had like a week of fake ads for Sprite or Burger King. The the Burger King ads might have ended up on the show, but I remember I have a file of fake funny ads I recorded. And then I thought, dude, 
Nobody likes listening to real ads, let alone ads for things that don't exist. Why are you wasting their time? So that's a bit of behind the scenes of the comedy part of the podcast. I hope you guys enjoyed it, and I hope you guys enjoyed the decisions I've made, right? We still got another thousand episodes or so in front of us, right? We're coming to the first thousand. Who knows where this show will grow till then, but... Until tomorrow, we got two more episodes of Dead Rabbit Radio Classics. I don't know what they are yet, but I do know what one of them is. One of them is the KGB vs. Aliens episode. And again, in other that episode's really weird. I just listened to that the other day, and I thought, you would have recorded a completely different episode today. So let's go ahead and take a look at that one tomorrow, and I will see you guys then.